There is a lot of anime out there. We are talking a medium that spans literally every genre of storytelling from the vanilla to tentacles. You know what I mean? You do. Perv. Anyway, my entire life, there has always been one section of the anime ethos I just didn't get. In fact, it took me watching Great Teacher Onizuka, something completely unrelated to put it into words. People who like Gundam speak a different language. A language that is completely unintelligible to outsiders and frankly... <laughs> <laughs> Reeks of virginity. It's not their fault, I'm sure they slay. But let's be honest, if you hear somebody talking about the Vulcan cannons on Gundam RX 78 CA, it's hard to imagine them communicating with a romantic interest. However, when you look at one of these bad boys, it's hard not to be impressed. Gundams are cool. That is undeniable. Mega swag on these mega robots. Big bad flying mech suits with giant guns and beam swords. They are iconic. Everyone knows what a Gundam is, but very few know a single thing about them. And that was me. Sure, I'd watch Gundam Wing and G Gundam, but it turns out that those are alternate universe shows, like the, like the Marvel Ultimate series, which I think might be an outdated reference. The Ultimate series is still a thing, right? Oh my god, it's not. <sighs> These side series are fun watches. Well, at least G Gundam is fun. Wing, Wing is a little dour. But G Gundam has mobile fighters. Gundam with a bodysuit control system that mimic real life human movement. Gundam Wing is, well, it's complicated. And I, I don't feel like explaining it again, so check out our video on it here. After this one, of course, come on. Regardless, it was in that moment while watching GTO where this normal girl loses her mind after getting stuck on a field trip with Gundam nerds that I realized I should learn the language. I mean, it's literally my job. I got friends within the anime YouTube sphere that are obsessed with Gundam. I got fans in the same boat as well. It's my duty and medical neurosis to know what they're talking about. So late last year, I decided to take the dive. I willingly chose to devote a ridiculous amount of time to consuming Gundam, doing research, figuring out what I needed to watch, and more specifically, how to watch it. And now I'm going to share it with you. Why? Because it was actually awesome, like incredibly good some of the best put together anime I have seen to date and I have watched an absurd, frankly unhealthy amount of anime. I'm going to give you a history of the franchise and a roadmap of exactly how I became a Gundam nerd because what I found when I actually took the time to give this universe of content a shot was something truly special. It's never too late to take that dive. I waited until I was 30 and I'm not going to pretend I'm the Gundam aficionado, but I did my due diligence and I made it into the conversation. I can speak some Gundam, but more importantly, I fell in love with the series. Naturally, I want the same for you. Here we go. The name's Bones, Mikey Bones. I'm in an undisclosed sponsored by NordVPN Witness Protection Location. When it comes to my cool guy lifestyle, having the right VPN is a life or death decision. NordVPN is the only one I trust. With Nord as my backup, not only do I got a family helping to stop mooks from trying to steal my data, but I also got way more options for shows to watch. Crunchyroll has geo restrictions, meaning you can't access certain anime if you're in the wrong country. But that's not a problem for a guy like me. I like my anime uncensored and I like your kneecaps on, all right, let's try to keep it that way. With just a couple of clicks, not only am I connected to whatever country of the dozens Nord gives me the option for, but I don't have to be hamstrung by region lock, and I know all about hamstringing clowns. With Nord, it's like blowing a lock, stealing all of somebody's best anime from the comfort of your own home. And it works for all streaming services. You can indefinitely expand your anime library with just the click of a button. So stop putting all your information on display and get a ton more shows to watch in the process. Get a deal you can't refuse on a two-year plan plus four bonus months by clicking the special personal discount link in the description. Oh, and the best part, it's risk-free with a 30-day back money guarantee. I swear, I'm a good guy. I'm literally giving you a way to get all the anime that you want for free. That's free protection. All you gotta do is click the link, and if you don't like it, because I'm a nice guy, you get it all back. So click that link in the description if you know what's good for you. Now back to it. 
So first things first, I am going to be hitting some plot points here and there, but this will be a spoiler-free video. My goal is to introduce newcomers to the Gundam franchise, specifically the main timeline. I'm going to be looking into each series in the order they take place in the timeline to give people a direction and a little bit of what to expect, as well as my personal feelings on each series. This is not a deep dive for Gundam nuts, but instead, it's my attempt at setting up a honey trap for the curious. If you are a Gundam enthusiast, I hope you enjoy hearing my experiences and opinions. For newbies, I recommend coming back to the video after you get sucked into Gundam, seeing how good a job I did, giving the video a like, commenting to tell me how awesome I am, and then subscribing and watching every single one of our videos five times. If you do love Gundam, please let me know which of the series that I'm talking about today is your favorite. I would really love to actually do deep, dedicated dives into these shows for you. Lastly, know that Gundam is one of those series, maybe the penultimate series, where you can't really miss an episode. There is constant character and plot development in every single episode, and if you miss one, you end up lost immediately. It is that intense and that well-written. Small note on that, not every single one of the series that I'm going to be talking about is necessary to watch in order to understand what's going on in the whole plot. We'll get into that later, but for now, it's history time. Gundam hit Japan like a brick 44 years ago in 1979 with Mobile Suit Gundam. Yes, the animated show was first, no manga, and it wasn't the first mecha anime, that's a rabbit hole of its own which I am not ready for, but it did, however, begin the real robot subgenre of the mech genre to its credit. To be classified as real robot, the depicted mechs need to be actual robots, not robots with mystical superpowers. These things need to make some kind of sense mechanically, they can be future futuristic but based within realism. Real Robot generally has mechs mass produced as mobile units for war. While the mechs are the draw, what generally locks people in are the complex characters and sweeping stories that accompany them. We're talking too many characters and allegiances to count. Series in this genre are therefore generally aimed at young adults instead of kids, and having watched Gundam Wing as a kid and understanding literally none of it, I absolutely feel that statement. Having watched the original 1979 Mobile Suit Gundam as an adult, I understand that statement. What I imagine nobody expected was how much this niche subgenre would impact the world. You fast forward those 44 years to now, and Gundam has spawned over 50 TV series, films, and OVAs, a mountain of manga and video games, and if you see those figures back there on my shelves, Gundam makes up 90% of that market. By 2000, the Gundam franchise had made $5 billion. Now it makes $774 million a year, almost half of that is model kits. They even created a virtual academy with some of the greatest minds in Japan focused entirely on making the technology in Gundam real. Gundam is a big deal. It's permanently affected anime and world pop culture and technology. A Gundam is just as iconic as Godzilla, Goku, Lum, or Hello Kitty, or even Mickey Mouse. Now because this video is for beginners, people who are interested in the series and maybe looking to get into it or get a taste of what it's about, I'm not going to get into crazy nitty gritty stuff or throw a bunch of names at you that you don't care about. It's more important to know that the series was put out by a subgroup at Sunrise Studios and created by Yoshiyuki Tomino, who's so famous there's actually a picture of him. The other important person to note is Kunio Oko the first person ever hired in the anime industry to be specifically a mechanical designer. Part of the reason people are so nuts about Gundam to begin with is the actual realism of the design and the science that went into creating this series. We're talking down to Lagrange points and the use of Helium-3 for power. For tech nerds, and let's be honest, there's a lot of those in Japan, Gundam is a dream come true. That said, not diving into that, if I start talking about Minovsky particles, I'm going to lose people. But in the end, and for most people, none of that really matters. What matters is whether the series is good. So what is the series? If I'm not talking about G Gundam or Gundam Wing or Witch from Mercury, what exactly am I talking about? And the answer is the Universal Century. The Universal Century is the core timeline of the Gundam franchise. It's the real deal, the original, and definitely the most complex, which is saying 
saying a lot, and let's be real, most people are in my boat, if they dipped a toe into Gundam, they likely watched Wing. That series alone has people switching sides left and right so often it's hard to tell what's going on half the time. And Gundam, like a lot of Japanese franchises, looking at you, Zelda, also didn't exactly come out in order from first to last. They're still slotting things into the Universal Century between the major series just willy-nilly. That creates a bit of whiplash. You start with a modern anime, then the sequel is made in 1979, and then you go into the early 90s anime, you get it. But honestly, it's kind of fun like that, but enough preamble. So obviously my first recommendation is to start with the Universal Century. You want to understand what Gundam is really about, and that is the human experience of war. Now, G Gundam is fun and all, but what a lot of people don't realize is how intricate and realized the Universal Century is. Some people say that Gundam is Japan's answer to Star Trek, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. Gundam is a space opera like no other, easily surpassing Star Wars in scope, and it is definitely better written. We've all seen anime and movies about war, and to be honest, it's generally not my go-to. However, Gundam carefully explores this experience through the eyes of complex characters with a wide range of human emotion from its initial debut until today. My next recommendation for you is to watch all of the Universal Century. Go all in. I mean, what kind of anime fan are you if you don't consume literally all of everything in a franchise? You can't even hold your head high up at a con. Come on, man. Don't be a loser's loser. That's self-deprecation. Also, before anybody freaks out in the comments, I'm not going over any films. I'm also stopping at Char's counterattack. If I don't have somebody by Double Zeta, I'm not going to catch them anyway. But for the uninitiated, no, almost every series has a film or two attached. Feel free to watch them if you want to. So now that you're primed, ready to give up multiple days, possibly weeks of your life, it's time to watch Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin Advent of the Red Comet. A genius move on Sunrise's part, this prequel came out in 2015 but leads directly into the original 1979 series Mobile Suit Gundam. A shiny new anime, Gundam Origins sets up the entire plot for literally everything you're going to watch moving forward and is super important. It introduces Char Aznable, his sister Sela, Amuro Rei, and the conflict that leads to the creation and mass production of mobile suits. The story starts in UC 0068, that's Universal Century 0068. At this time, humans have taken to space and millions and millions of people are inhabiting giant rotating space colonies that are actually based on the O'Neill Cylinder, which was a concept designed by American physicists in 1976 for real human space colonization. And I see that glazed look in your eyes, snap out of it. There's there's also no Gundams yet, and there won't be so chill. In the beginning, there isn't even mobile suits. People still live on Earth, but in order to keep the planet from dying, the space colonies were necessary. However, the longer the colonies spent away from unification with Earth, the more independent and unique they became, eventually creating their own cultures and governing bodies. You see, the plan was always to have Earth be the overseers and centralized government of the space colonies, but this became more and more difficult as time went on. One colony in particular, the Republic of Munzo, had begun to fight for independence under a man called Zeon Zoom Daikun. They wanted independence from the Earth Federation and the freedom to be their own state, which honestly makes sense. It's essentially what happened with America and Britain. Eventually, it didn't make sense to be ruled by a little tiny island thousands of miles away, especially when they're taxing you all to hell and saying things like tickety boo. Now, let me be clear the events that transpire in Gundam Origin are all things that you're kind of supposed to know or have sussed out over time from watching the other series. Now, you don't don't have to. That being said, jumping into it can be a bit confusing, so I'm going to give you the basic points and ask that when you watch the series, you drop your preconceived notions of what you think Gundam is. So Zykun, again, the revolutionary leader of Munzo, dies randomly while giving a speech, which sends the colony into mass panic and riots ensue. Conspiracies run rampant, and Zykun's children, who are told their father was murdered by his second-in-command, Zabi, need to be evacuated to Earth immediately immediately before they become political hostages. These kids would be Casval and his little sister Artesia. Eventually, they become Char and Sela, major players in the main series to come. Meanwhile, the Zabi family takes over the colony of Munzo. As you can see already, Gundam isn't exactly a knockdown drag out series. It's far from a shonen. There is political intrigue, conspiracy, a setting that matches the plot and allows for critical thinking. The line between good and evil is often blurred. Actually, it's 
always blurred. Sometimes good people can do horrible things and bad people can turn out to be heroes. The idea of each side seeing themselves as a hero is excellently portrayed in these series. That said, whether you think that people can come back from some of the shit that Gundam characters pull is inevitably up to you. All that in mind, the Zabi family who took over the Republic of Munzo is full of pretty evil bastards. They renamed the Republic to the Republic of Zeon after Zeon Zaikun, the original revolutionary for the Republic of Munzo, as a propaganda move and begin to work towards full armed rebellion from Earth. Meanwhile, Kazval and Artesia, again Zeon Zaikun's kids, get to deal with some pretty serious trauma which I'm skipping and end up with new names on the Texas space colony, yes it's a space colony called Texas and it's basically Texas, a colony which Kazval eventually leaves with his friend Char to join the Loom Military Academy. Meanwhile the Zabi family are working on a top secret weapons project called MS, guess what that stands for. And this is when the S really hits the F. Long story short, Kazval gets Char killed in order to fake his own death and then assumes Char's identity. And this is one he will keep for a long time. TLDR, Kazval, son of the revolutionary leader Zykun becomes Char Aznabal, the dude with the helmet, you know what he looks like. And you know what, at this point I took a day to mull over what I've written so far and I realized that I'm already overcomplicating things and that's the problem isn't it? Anytime some nerd starts talking about Gundam, you lose concentration and it becomes like this incredibly outdated Charlie Brown reference right here. So what you need to know is that the bad guys create a mobile suit army, they begin a full scale war with Earth and eventually commit a war crime you couldn't possibly imagine. One so massive that it changes Earth forever, like the actual entire planet. Let's just say the force of the catastrophe was 60,000 megatons. To put that into perspective, the largest nuclear bomb in history had a force of 50 megatons. That's equivalent to 50 million tons of dynamite, over 110 billion pounds of dynamite. Now multiply that by 60,000, that's how intense it was. Anyway, until 2015, people had just heard about this war crime before it was actually animated in a show, but seeing it is crazy man. But the advent of mobile suits changed everything and we're just talking mobile suits, not Gundam. Think of them as like TIE fighters and X-wings in Star Wars, right? Except cooler and far more mobile with the ability to pack high intensity weapons. Space battle is a lot like naval battles, you got your big destroyers and your little fast boats. The Big ships have giant guns, but they can't really hit the smaller ships. Mobile suits, however, can destroy the big ships and each other and people and everything else. But this is how Char Aznabal gains the name the Red Comet. He eventually becomes a mobile suit pilot for the Principality of Xeon, which if you're paying attention are the bad guys, the people he thinks murdered his father. How's that happen? You gotta watch. But Char is kind of awesome. He flies a customized Zaku 2, which is an extremely early mobile suit unit. Again, not a Gundam, painted red and sinks five battleships in one campaign like a boss. And again, notice I haven't talked about actual Gundams yet, and that's because there aren't any in the war yet. The first prototype is currently being developed in secret on Colony Side 7. The son of the scientist in charge of development on the Gundam is Amuro Ray. He discovers the construction of the mech and begins to study the machine in secret. The main takeaway is that Char is an extremely complex character and a hero for the Xeon forces in what will eventually be called the One Year War, at least at, at first. <laughs> doing it again. Also, his sister Sela is super important as well. Let's move on. So you gotta know what the One Year War is though, right? It takes place in 0079 of the Universal Century timeline until 0080, which makes it a One Year War, but it's where like half of what I'm going to talk about takes place. The next thing you're going to 100% need to watch, absolutely period, is Mobile Suit Gundam. It's not an option to skip this show. Virtually everything that takes place within it is important for the rest of the entire series. And for a lot of people that's going to be a pretty hard pill to swallow, Mobile Suit Gundam is a 44 year old anime. And if you've watched a lot of anime from the time period like myself, you know some of it can be pretty rough. However, I stake my credibility on the fact that the original Mobile Suit Gundam is not rough. MSG just hits 
different. It is a fantastic show that instantly passes the kid dies test in episode one. That's how you know if an anime is going to be boss or not. Kid dies, you know you're in for something real. And as you can see, the animation is obviously of a different time and going from Gundam Origin to Mobile Suit Gundam is like a DeLorean trip, but you settle in very quickly. There are definitely some repeated animations here and there, but the overall quality of the show is a Plus, I would also like to recommend something that I very rarely do, but watch the early 2000s Ocean Dub, which you can find on Crunchyroll. It's fantastic. It is the year 0079 of the Universal Century. A half century has passed since Earth began moving its burgeoning population into gigantic orbiting space colonies. I'll take mm -hmm. over. I just have to watch the gauges, right? I'd appreciate it if you could, just until we dock. You think an old wreck of a boat like that is gonna have what we need? Try to be realistic, Charm. I'm only doing this to protect myself. Oh, that's the reason? Yeah. Yelling at me is really gonna help me handle this thing. Hayato, let's get this over with and hightail it out of here, all right? Between the dub and the crispy clean restoration, the anime feels modern while looking retro, which is saying a lot for a production as old as it is. The creative team at Sunrise put their absolute all into Mobile Suit Gundam, like more than their all. It's one of those cases where a Japanese team went above and beyond what should be humanly possible, and it shows to this day. Mobile Suit Gundam sets up the foundation for the entire series and timeline. Multiple characters from the series will pop up in later ones, and battles within the show will become legendary, referenced time and time again in later series. It stars Amuro Rei, the first Gundam protagonist and eventual war hero, who you kind of have to understand to get where the series is going. In the beginning, Amuro is a kid living in a space colony on side 7. His dad is a super scientist guy who's been working on a prototype weapon for the Earth Federation to combat the mobile suit threat from the Principality of Xeon. That weapon is the RX-78-2 Gundam. And a little fun trivia for you, the reason Gundam is called Gundam is because they're supposed to be so badass that they're akin to a dam made out of guns. I'm not lying to you, therefore, Gundam. Yeah, I, I just have a question, um, is this a goddamn? <laughs> God damn. But when Amuro's colony is attacked by Xeon forces led by none other than Char Aznable, Kid dies, Amuro finds his dad's Gundam, and just gets in it. At the same time, the mothership White Base, which had arrived to pick up the Gundam, is now forced to take on refugees from Side 7. Meanwhile, Amuro successfully fights off the Xeon mobile suits and joins the rest of his colonists on White Base, which if I don't mention is a Pegasus class warship, somebody is going to cry in the comments. But here is where things get weird. Gundam can't be piloted by just anybody. They're experimental mobile suits and the RX-78 is the first of their kind. They're faster, stronger, and far more complex than a typical mobile suit, especially the weak Federation Force Max. The G-Force a pilot has to deal with when operating one would knock most on unconscious, and because of this, Amuro, a kid, becomes its de facto pilot. Thanks to Gundam Origin, this makes a little more sense, seeing as how we now know that Amuro had been studying the thing for a while before the series even started. But at least, he isn't alone, right? The few people who survived the assault on Side 7, most of them children, begin working on White Base under Bright Noah, a 19-year-old ensign who is forced to take command of the White Base when the attack on Side 7 kills most of the crew. Kids going to war is a huge part of the universal century. So all of this leaves the white base in a weird no man's land militarily. The fighting crew is half civilian and mostly young teens to straight up children who are forced to take up arms during the worst conflicts since the universal century began. The white base also has no distinct designation at first and must journey back to Earth while being constantly assaulted by Xeon forces and Char Aznable. It's also important to point out again that Gundam was a show designed for adults. Young adults, but adults nonetheless. People die. Like, important characters which leave lasting scars on not just Amuro, but the entire crew, and it'll make you upset. The series is essentially one long journey of the white base as it navigates its way throughout the one year war, getting sucked into battle after battle on Earth and in space. As Amuro becomes a better and better pilot, the white base and its new Gundam become famous heroic figures of the Earth Federation, especially as Amuro becomes more and more badass eventually having to unlock most of the safety features on his Gundam because it can't keep up with his abilities at a certain point. Which brings up a really weird but pervasive part of the Universal Century Gundam story, 
new types. You see, one of the things the Principality of Xeon is interested in or is fighting for is the next evolution of the human species. Of course, this was originally theoretical, but they believed with mankind taking to space permanently, it would usher in a change in the species genetics. And then it actually happens. So what the fuck is a new type? The best way I can explain it is it's like a pseudo Jedi. New types are particularly sensitive psychically. They can feel other people's emotions or deaths and stuff they know when danger is coming they have superhuman reflexes it's a little nebulous and ill-defined but when two of them come face to face forget about it weird shit just happens they can communicate telepathically like all sorts of stuff the only thing they can't do is like a force blast or levitate things at least from what i've seen so far new types emerge during the one year war through stress and trauma to make incredible mobile suit pilots again it's really weird just was, you'll, you'll see. It's also important to mention that throughout all of its battles, the white base is constantly hounded by Char as Nabal specifically. However, his long lost sister Sela is an active member of the white base's crew pitting the two siblings and scions of Xeon against each other. The main reason the series is mandatory is because the White Base and Amuro and Bright Noah are present at every major battle in the One Year War, including the final conflict. The characters on White Base, as well as Char, will be in the preceding mainline series as Mobile Suit Gundam sets the stage for everything that comes next. And by next, I mean now. So for a bit, these series are going to be optional, okay? But they all take place during the one year war. Of course, I recommend watching all of them as some are the best in the entire franchise, let alone the Universal Century, except one, there is one you should absolutely skip. Anyway, most of them are relatively short in comparison to the mainline shows as well. Their production also spans the entire existence of the franchise. However, we're gonna go through them in order canonically, which is also how I think you should watch them and it's how I watch them. Feel free to reference this video for a watch order. The first series after Mobile Suit Gundam is a little known one one called MS Igloo. And let me tell you, it is absolutely shit. Like there is nothing redeemable here from story to presentation. Igloo has some of the worst CGI I have ever seen. It looks worse than PS2 cutscenes. Frankly, for a series as great as Gundam, Igloo and its sequels are embarrassing. They're also incredibly hard to find and you cannot get them normally. If you really want to punish yourself that bad like I did, prepare for hours and hours of download time I'm glad it's out there for prosperity, but just give up on Igloo and save yourself the pain. It is not even, it's like not even funny bad. Nothing that happens within it is ever mentioned again, and it's not important. I cannot emphasize this enough. Just don't watch it. So instead, let's talk about Mobile Suit Gundam, the 08th MST. This short series of OVAs slapped so hard. It was released from 1996 to 1999, and it just, it has the look I'm always talking about. Sexy, crisp, and clean late 90s. 90s animation. This is one of the best looking series in my opinion. As far as the story, it's pretty killer too. It takes place solely on Earth in UC0079 during the One Year War in Southeast Asia, where the Earth Federation and the Principality of Xeon are embroiled in a vicious guerrilla war over resources. It's essentially the Gundam Vietnam War. Reinforcements arrive including a man named Shiro who becomes the new captain of the 08th MS team, an elite unit of prototype Gundam which initially confused me as up until now, the assumption was that Amado's Gundam was the only one in the field. Looking into the 08th MS team's mechs clears up the confusion, right? So if you remember, Amado's Gundam, the original, was an RX-78. These are RX-79 ground types. They're made of spare lower grade parts that were supposed to be used to mass produce the RX-78. The 79G are also stripped of all parts made for space battle and tweaked specifically to fight within gravitational fields. I don't know. I think that's cool. They also look pretty baller. The main conflict turns into a battle between the 08th unit and a new incredibly powerful prototype Xeon mobile suit. However, there's an emotional twist for Shiro that sends everything into chaos. As far as main characters from Gundam series goes, Shiro is definitely up there with the best of them. The Universal Century really doesn't play around with militarism, but Shiro is an independent person who is willing to disobey
obey orders if he feels they're wrong. I like this a lot, and from what I've heard from other Gundam dorks, it's definitely up there with the best of the best. And then after that is a cult classic that a lot of people have probably heard of, Mobile Suit Gundam 0080 War in the Pocket. While on my Gundam journey, I was told multiple times by multiple different people that this short six episode OVA is absolutely peak Gundam. It was released in 1989, the anime is beautiful, and I'm sure from the name you can guess it takes place in UC 0079. No, I didn't misspeak. But despite everybody's enthusiasm, in my onion, I think this is one of the weirder side stories as it focuses on the experiences of a 10 year old boy. However, because this is such an isolated and small series and it kind of really encapsulates everything that Gundam is about, it's probably the most popular within the Universal Century. You essentially don't need to know anything about Gundam to enjoy this one. No new types, no complicated bullshit, just a small story about a kid who messes up real bad, like really really bad. But before getting into that, I'd like to talk about the war that Universal Century depicts, more specifically the kind of war that it depicts. Before World War II, there was this idea of war that no longer exists today. There was a romanticism to it, the idea of adventure, camaraderie, exploration, and, and heroism. At the start of World War I in 1914, troops on both sides of the conflict went into battle with these kinds of fantasies before reality kicked in. Without getting too far into the real history, World War I very soon became a bloody, never-ending feudal massacre on a scale literally never seen before. For years, troops would gain a mile, then lose it again, while constantly being pounded by artillery at all times. They lived in wet holes filled with corpses and toxic chemicals. People lost their minds and were executed for it because PTSD wasn't understood at the time. Gundam takes a lot from that time period rather than World War II, mostly because the Japanese don't want to talk about World War II. More specifically, these war crimes resulted in the deaths of between 3 and 14 million people and include systematic extermination. Furthermore, virtual enslavement of people took place as laborers or enforced prostitution. Captors were used for experimentation. Referring to their victims as maruta, meaning logs, they dissected their victims alive. No anesthetic. Rather, they were vivisected while fully conscious. Next up, we have limb amputation. Some even had organs detached, then reattached in unique ways. Experiment Experiments were also conducted with high pressure, poisonous chemical exposure, centrifuges, burning. But a common consensus in the latter years of the First World War on both sides was this isn't war. Soldiers on both sides were soon exhausted, frustrated, traumatized, and just over it. The people on the ground didn't want to fight anymore, but they were compelled to by the brass who had little compassion or understanding of their situation. Gundam explores these notions often, and it's done well in War in the Pocket. Al Izuhara is a 10 year old boy who thinks war is awesome. He wants to grow up to be a soldier and fight for honor. However, he lives in the neutral colony of Side 6, a neutral colony who happens to be housing a new Gundam prototype that was launched launched into space after a Xeon assault on Earth's Antarctic base. An elite Xeon commando unit is sent to Side 6 to destroy this new Gundam, but is massacred, leaving only one soldier, Bernie, alive after he crashes his mobile suit within the colony. He's soon discovered by Al, who becomes infatuated with him despite him being a Xeon soldier. And I don't want to spoil anything at all from this one, but shit goes down hard. Tragedy occurs, there's love and loss, it's a pretty wild ride, and it's also really sad. I enjoyed it. I think I I'd watch it again, it's certainly one of the better looking series out there, but compared to a lot of others, it's in the middle of my list. That being said, it is an excellent study of what being young and enthusiastic while completely naive is like during wartime, and how that innocence is so easily shattered. Gundam can be super evil like that. Now next up is another series to initially take place in UC-79, Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt. Again, we got a big jump from 1989 to 2015, and Thunderbolt is easily the shiniest series so far and it is also wild. Based off the manga of the same name, MSG Thunderbolt takes place in the Thunderbolt section of space. It's a place densely packed with asteroids and debris from destroyed ships which can set off electrical discharges regularly. It's a very unstable section of space and a lot of the background of this series is very complicated so I'm not going to wreck your mind with it, but you're going to be hit with some confusing stuff immediately if you're watching in order like I've suggested that you do. The first thing is the FA-78 Full Armor Gundam Thunderbolt. 
this thing is flippin' insane, looking closer to a mech from Gundam Wing than one from the Universal Sentry, let alone a Gundam from 0079. From what we've seen so far, you have the OG Gundam Amado pilots, then you have the ground type and 08th MS team, and of course the prototype from War in the Pocket, but Thunderbolt? I mean, this thing is wild. Apparently developed by an isolated team of Earth Federation mech engineers called the Moore Brotherhood, Thunderbolt was created with the Thunderbolt section of space in mind. This thing is kitted out to the max. It's unlike anything we've seen up to this point. From missiles to the overabundant shielding, Thunderbolt looks like a monster, and it totally is. It's overcompensation to the max in order to make up for the extreme armor. More thrusters have been installed, allowing the mobile suit to absolutely scream. Now, the people who designed the suit, the Moore Brotherhood, is made up of survivors from the colonies on side four, which were destroyed by Xeon, and they are hell-bent on getting revenge. This puts Io Fleming, the pilot of Gundam Thunderbolt, up against Xeon's living dead division in the Thunderbolt sector. Io was originally a racer on side four and is also a jazz enthusiast, which gives the series its extremely unique flavor, music. Well, I'm not going to dive too far into that. But what's important to know is that Io is tasked with taking out the Living Dead sniper unit led by the Principality of Xeon's best sniper, Daryl Lorenz, who is a pop enthusiast, leading to not only a militaristic clash between the two, but a clash between taste and appreciation of the arts. It's important to note that Daryl Lorenz has his legs blown off in a battle early on in the One Year War. Everybody in this Living Dead squadron is an amputee of some kind. It's really interesting. And Daryl eventually receives his own insane mobile suit prototype, and the clashes between him and Io are a real sight to behold. Thunderbolt is a fascinating and extremely fast-paced series that eventually ties into the original Mobile Suit Gundam, and it's one you are 100% going to want to see. Thunderbolt is a Gundam that people talk about a lot. It's polished all to hell and is a great representation of how good Gundam still is and what modern animation can bring to the series. It's important to note that the canonicity of this series is in debate, but I am definitely on the side of it being canon. Why not when everything else is? I don't understand the argument. The season two of the series finally takes us into UC-00. 80, and eventually into my favorite series that I'll be discussing in this video, Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 Stardust Memory. Released in the utopic year of 1991, Stardust Memory is a short series that just hit all of my buttons. First off, I think it has the best look and feel out of everything I'm going to be talking about here, period. There is just something about this time period of animation from Japan that is so iconic and nostalgic. You add in it's a series of OVAs with a solid budget and excellent animation team behind the works and you are set up for mm, success. It's 0083. The One Year War has been over for a while, but the Principality of Xeon forces have stolen a highly destructive Gundam prototype with nuclear capabilities. Naturally, it's up to the Earth Federation to retrieve their stolen weapon. A 19-year-old soldier named Ko Uraki finds himself as the pilot of the RX-78 GP-01 Gundam Zephranthus, or Zephranth? If this fire this, uh, it's Greek, I don't know. And this is the first Gundam hobby kit I bought. What I loved so much about this one is that it's a very obvious visual upgrade from Amado's RX-78. It's essentially the next in line. It has the same look and feel of the original Gundam. It's just cooler. And this alone makes Stardust Memories feel even more nostalgic after watching quite a few side stories since the original Mobile Suit Gundam. And Ko's journey to stop Operation Stardust from happening is incredibly compelling, and the end of the series is run is one that has stuck with me more than any other that I've watched. It is tragic, but really interesting. Stardust Memories, besides being full of great characters and some really cool Gundam prototypes, shows a side of war people literally don't ever get to see or hear about. People who've watched this one know exactly what I mean by that. And if you don't watch anything between Mobile Suit Gundam and the next show on the list, make sure you watch Stardust Memories. It is fantastic. Speaking of the next show, it is finally time to get back on track with the main series in the Universal Century with Mobile Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, not Z Gundam, Zeta Gundam. But I want to make a note here about learning to love characters. The main Gundam series can be a bit difficult to transition between. Each entry has a new protagonist and each one is vastly different from their predecessor. While technically the sequel to Mobile Suit Gundam, Zeta Gundam stars Camille Bidon, a kid who could not be farther from Amado Ray. You aren't going to be seeing comfortable carbon copies of Amado or even events similar to his adventures with the White Base. While Char, sorry, not not Char, I mean Quattro Bugina. No way that's Char.
Bright Noah, and a slew of other characters from the first series show up and play major roles. Camille is different. The war is different. Things have changed. Sides have changed. Players have changed. And it takes a little bit to get used to that. And at first, I didn't like Camille. He's more aggressive than Amaro. He's more whiny too. And this, of course, is due to the fact that he gets some pretty serious trauma early on in the show. But what you realize fast is that each Gundam entry has a growing period for the characters. While I initially kind of hated Camille, he and Zeta Gundam quickly became my favorite in the mainline series. Set in UC-0087 and released in 1985, Zeta Gundam is a different beast entirely. With the one year war long over, things have changed and like all Gundam pilots in the series, Camille finds himself unexpectedly the pilot of a Gundam and embroiled in a massive conflict. However, this time, it isn't clear cut, earth good, Zeon bad kind of deal. There's enemies on both sides and despite Camille's initial immaturity and temper, he eventually shows a deep compassion, especially after his new type powers awaken. He also has to deal with living in the shadow of Amado and becoming a pilot and warrior in his own right. If Mobile Suit Gundam had teeth, Zeta Gundam has fangs. It is a brutal story that further expands the concept of new types and the ferocity of war, and the ending, I, like, I can't recommend this one enough. I mean, at this point in your journey, you're hopefully fully involved, but if you're just going from Mobile Suit Gundam to Zeta in order to get the basic story, stick with it. Zeta will have you you on the edge of your seat up until the end where you completely fall off. That all said, uh, I do have one issue with the show and that is Zeta Gundam itself. I really don't like the way it looked with its strangely thin head. Thankfully, that's not really an issue with the next series. And that would be Gundam Double Zeta. Again, not ZZ, Double Zeta. And this series is interesting, to say the least. With the emotional power of Zeta Gundam and its insane ending, I was so excited to immediately dive into another mainline series right away. And then I met Judo Ashita. It is immediately apparent that Double Zeta is not Zeta. And more than that, Judo is not Camille. And this is why I recommended taking in the side content in between Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta. You get smaller stories, excluding Thunderbolt, that allow you to kind of get used to new characters and events. The mainline shows are much longer. They're usually about 50 episodes, and because of that, you tend to get more attached to the protagonist. By the end of Zeta, I was so dedicated to Camille that switching to anyone else was going to be a bit of a struggle. But Judo was a bit too much. Zeta Gundam was a dark and mature show, much darker than the original and most of the content content in between. However, that worked to its benefit, making it one of the best, if not the best, in the series. Double Zeta, I don't know, man, it is whiplash. Judo and his group of friends are poor junk collectors living on the colony where Camille ends up after Zeta Gundam. Judo is kind of a punk, but incredibly immature. The entire group of friends is. And like the rest of the mainline series, obviously he ends up with Captain Bright Noah and piloting a new Gundam prototype, this time the Double Zeta. And unlike the Zeta Gundam, I absolutely love Double Zeta, so much that it was the second Gundam kit I bought. It's a badass machine. As far as the series goes, it's frustrating. Now, I don't want to turn anyone off from Mobile Suit Double Zeta Gundam because it is a necessary watch, but it does have some things going against it at first. Number one, there's no dub. Before any fanboys get on my case, I'm well aware that there was a, like, Southeast Asian dub that was done in English, but it's basically lost media. You can't find it, and it's also not even complete, so so I doesn't count. And normally that wouldn't be something I care about. I generally watch things subbed as is, but for some reason I watched all of Gundam minus Thunderbolt dubbed. Part of the reason for that is just how good the dubs actually are, and I really can't express how nice it is to hear good dubs. Second, Double Zeta's initial immaturity as a show after the incredible darkness of Zeta Gundam is kind of a slap in the face. Some of the things the new crew does would get anyone court-martialed in a second, but they get away with everything? It's, it's a little bit unrealistic. Well, they get away with mostly everything. I can't believe it took me this long to mention how often people get slapped in the face in this timeline. It is honestly hilarious. Nobody is safe from the face slap. And it's also not like previous characters hadn't pulled some crazy shit, but Judo's crew is next level, like literally really criminally next level. Lastly, the show takes a while to get going. That's really the killer. Again, this is my personal opinion, but Double Zeta Gundam has one of the slowest ramp ups that I've seen so far. Judo's initial objectives are completely personal, but those objectives, mostly saving his sister, sees him constantly messing up, going off on his own, endangering the crew, and generally pissing people off, making him seem like a total jerk. That said, when Double Zeta takes a turn, it turns hard. Unfortunately, it takes 24 
five episodes to get there, but when Double Zeta hits, it hits so hard. The characters come together, the maturity kicks in, the darkness comes. I don't know how to explain it other than the payoff is impeccable. It can be a little bit of a weird ride to get there, but it is so worth it. And honestly, given Judo's character, it makes sense that it would take him that long to grow up and get in the fight for real, for a bigger purpose. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean it's always fun to watch him make mistake after mistake to get there, but that's kind of like realistic. My main point is that you really want to stick through that to get to the payoff in the second half of the series. You gotta trust me on it. And this all said, if you've watched any Gundam, including Wing or G, you know that the best parts always come after the first 25 episodes of setup anyway. That should just kind of be expected. What makes this one harder than the others is that it comes straight off the heels of Zeta Gundam, which would be hard for any show. And so where do you go from there? And the answer is simple. It's Char's Counterattack, which is a movie and it basically caps off the initial Universal Century run. Everything up to this point is to get to this film, and believe me when I say, you want to get there. And after that, you got Gundam Unicorn, followed by two movies, Gundam Narrative and Gundam Hathaway. And for reference, Double Zeta Gundam takes place in UC-0088, Char's Counterattack in 0093, and Unicorn through Hathaway spans 96 to 105. That's 37 years of the Universal Century I've covered. The next series, Victory Gundam, doesn't happen until 0153. And man, I am 12 pages deep, single space, 11 font, and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. There's so much within Gundam that can be looked at through a microscope. It's honestly so hard to point out what's so dramatically fantastic about the series in a video like this. I can feel myself wanting to reach farther, but I just can't given the scope here. But I think that's saying something in and of itself, right? The fact that I want to say more and have significantly more to say. Gundam has had a legitimately profound impact on what I know I can expect from anime. The careful, meticulous nature of the plot progression and more importantly, character growth is beyond. Next level, watching children get sucked into war, maturing and dealing with the harsh reality of that situation, watching loved ones die and realizing that sometimes you have to fight, especially when you have the power to do so, and, and the, the results of what that can cause, how minor mistakes can have huge consequences, it's very impactful. And each entry does this so differently with drastically different characters, it is really something to behold. And also, there's badass giant robots, so go forth and behold it! Most of the series can be found on common streaming platforms like Crunchyroll. Both Origin and Mobile Suit Gundam are, and that's all you need to get started. You will have to dig for a lot of the better, smaller series like 08th MS Team and Stardust Memories, but your anime fans, you know how to do that. You've done it before, you'll do it again. It's not your fault that certain anime just aren't available any other way. But hopefully this was helpful and gave you enough of a tease to push you over the edge of curiosity and into action. That's my only goal with this video. I want you to watch Gundam. And again, if you are a major Gundam fan already, please let me know what you'd like me to cover in depth. I'd be glad to do it and I'd love to hear people's impressions of Gundam when they get into it. So don't forget to come back and let me know what you thought. But for now, that's it. That's all. My name is Mike. This is Bonsai Pop. Check out the sponsor and I'll see you next time.